Hello and welcome to Derecho, Disaster and Disadvantage, a program of the UI Center for Human Rights. In this hour, we will explore how natural disasters such as the August 10th Derecho in Eastern Iowa disproportionately affect already underserved and marginalized communities. My name is Colleen Opel. I'm the program coordinator in the UI Center for Human Rights. I'm honored to welcome two speakers today. First, Raymond Seidel is a community organizer in Cedar Rapids who started coordinating grassroots efforts on the day of the storm using social media and has since garnered thousands of dollars in donations to those in need, fed and provided resources for thousands of people and directed the efforts of hundreds of volunteers. Then Dr. Eric Tate will speak. He's an associate professor in the Geographical and Sustainability Sciences Department at the University of Iowa. Dr. Tate studies social equity in disaster mitigation and recovery spending and vulnerability and risk related to natural disasters. At University of Iowa, he's also a faculty affiliate with IIHR Hydroscience and Engineering, the Center for Global Environmental Research, and the Public Policy Center. If you have questions throughout the presentation, pre please submit those using the Q&A link in Zoom. We will reserve the last 15 minutes or so for Q&A. To see a recording of this and previous events, please visit our website at uichr.org and visit the YouTube link. There you can also make a tax deductible donation to support our work and access resources related to our event today. And now I will turn it over to Raymond Seidel. Good afternoon. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so as a community organizer for the Iowa Derecho Storm resource page uh, on Facebook, um, you know, my initial goal was to reach out to the community um, just to start to bring people together, um, not really knowing what uh, the need was uh, right out of the gate other than um, hopefully being able to talk to uh, our fellow community members as well as uh, start down the road of recovery. And through the Facebook group that I uh, initiated back on August 10th, um, you know, it has led to uh, what we have today, which is a uh, resource center where we're providing uh, items uh, such as non-perishable food items, uh, uh, hygiene products, as well as items to protect property. Um, and what we have experienced during this uh, endeavor is that um, there are there was so much more of a need than uh, probably URI or anybody watching could imagine, um, just not really having been through something like this before. And so through the group, uh, you know, we uh, continue or we started to bring people together um, throughout the community and then across the nation as well. And as time has gone on, what we've experienced is that uh, the need is not uh, necessarily going away just because uh, time has gone on and the power is back. So um, what I want to share with everybody today is just a little bit about the uh, communities in which we're still helping today. Um, uh, as you all know, it's uh, just over three weeks from this uh, terrible event. Um, and so I have a, a couple of photos that I would like to share here, I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me just a moment um, and talk about uh, just some of the communities that we have uh, been in contact with. Um, so again, when we set up the, the resource site, um, initially it was uh, individuals coming to us to get their basic needs met. Um, volunteers asking how they could to neighborhoods, um, apartment complexes, home parks, uh, what power they would find people that were affected. Um, what we quickly realized was that there were neighborhoods, apartment complexes, and uh, mobile home parks that were um, not really getting the uh, attention and help that they needed. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of those fell in low income areas and those areas um, assisting uh, the refugee community. Uh, and so we started mobilizing vehicles with goods uh, via volunteers into those neighborhoods, providing uh, some of their basic needs and resources, um, as well as just some social workers that were going out and checking on individuals um, 
to see uh, what they need, if they were okay. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip through a couple of pictures here that we've put together, um, that we've collected from our Facebook page as well as uh, some of our volunteers here. So the Cedar Terrace apartments uh, were heavily hit, uh, missing, uh, as you can see in this first photo here, a lot of the roof. Uh, this is a, a apartment complex that got a lot of attention for individuals that were sleeping in tents, uh, sleeping in vehicles, um, and coming together as a community to try to get their basic needs met. Um, so again, here's some uh, makeshift housing that was put together. Um, and this is a this is a low income and high refugee population area um, that just really did not get the, the support that they needed to start to the road recovery. But also, as we can see from this image here, um, there was no roof on a lot of these buildings. So it was not safe for them to be in the buildings, nor was it really safe for them to be on the grounds um, should the building be unstable. Um, and it took uh, six to seven days. They did it over a two day period where they actually evacuated these apartments um, and got them into a safe uh, uh, temporary housing situation um, of which they are still in and uh, can, you know, it's going to be a little bit before they get into some sort of permanent due to the damage to not just their apartment complex, but apartment complexes across the area. Um, so that's the Cedar Terrace. Um, we're going to hop over here to the Linwood Apartments. Um, these uh, individuals were um, outside and uh, we were out delivering some uh, for Patriot meals, their 72 hour meal kits um, and some bottles of water as well as some solar power um, chargers for their devices. Um, some of the areas, you know, it, it took them a lot longer before they got their power restored. Um, and although power is restored to the most of the area now, uh, there's still a lot of need here with uh, people depleting their funds to either move themselves, uh, pack up their belongings, stay in a hotel room, um, and pay deductibles. There's a lot of uh, basic needs that we're going to end up to the wayside just so people can protect their property, uh, be it uh, housing and or personal property. Um, a couple of mobile home parks here in town got hit pretty bad. So this is the Edgewood Forest Mobile Home Park. Again, a low income area, um, housing a lot of refugees. Uh, and uh, thankfully we do have some school administrators that are uh, visiting uh, this mobile home park on a regular basis, bringing their um, uh, bringing them their, their basic needs. This photo was actually just taken yesterday and I have a couple of them here. And uh, there are people still living in this uh, mobile home park. And I can't say that I saw one uh, mobile home without damage. So um, definitely still some uh, uh, treacherous situations that people are living in. You know, we're a little over three weeks after the storm. Um, so uh, that, um, you know, speaks volumes to the resources that are still needed to uh, help out individuals who are in mobile home parks, apartment complexes, or housing, uh, single family dwellings even, uh, that were hit hard. And uh, it's taking so long for them to get to a safe place, get to the, re get to the resources that they need. Um, the temporary shelters that we had have since closed. Um, and uh, the, the people who were evacuated uh, were moved to um, homeless shelters at this point. So uh, they're still definitely in a, tr a temporary transitional situation that uh, will lead to the need for some, uh, hopefully some permanent housing very soon. Um, but we know with the extent of the damage, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, areas that were affected that will need to be rebuilt before um, that, that can take place. Um, the resource site that we set up, uh, people can come and members of the community can come to our location at 4001 First Avenue Southeast in Cedar Rapids. Um, they can fill out a form, write down what they need, um, and we have shoppers that will uh, go through and, and find those items for them. So this is just a couple images of inside the, the resource center here um, that we have that I wanted to share with everybody so everybody knows, uh, you know, that uh, we have a, a good operation going here. We have a lot of uh, items to, to continue to serve the community um, and to do it for the next uh, couple of weeks or months, whatever it takes to make sure that the basic needs are met of the individuals affected by this storm. Um, just another few pictures here. We did get some cold refrigeration and freezer space uh, as of yesterday. So we will be offering some perishable items. Um, and we are also offering all of the city, uh, FEMA and um, DHS, 
uh, resources as well at our site, um, along with some assistance on a um, inconsistent basis, but we do have some people who are showing up to help uh, fill out forms and get access to the resources that they need. So um, just stop on by for, for that. Um, and then just another uh, set of apartments that were uh, just ravished from the storm. This is on the west side of Cedar Rapids. Uh, these are the West Hill Court apartments. And again, another low uh, income housing development. And um, my understanding from uh, my conversations with other community members um, is uh, only some of the buildings have been um, evacuated. There are still people living in the area, which um, you know the the buildings that they're living in most likely still have a roof. But um, there's a, this is a dangerous situation just to be around the debris. Um, I have we've seen. Um, children walking through the debris, walking in buildings that have collapsed. Um, so just, uh, you know, a very scary situation over there. Um, and it will be some time before, you know, the those buildings are um, dealt with, really. I mean, unfortunately, they've sustained such, uh, such a large amount of damage. Um, so just want to share with you a little bit about the Resource Center and, of course, some of the images here uh, from our community and uh, what uh, you know, some of our low in most of our low income households were, uh, you know, deeply affected by this. And unfortunately, a lot of them, uh, a lot of the individuals living there, were there for nearly a week uh, before uh, they were um, assigned temporary housing. So um, I'm hoping to see some uh, more more temporary housing become available. Um, as well as some permanent uh, housing in the very near future so that we can help everybody uh, get back onto the road to recovery. Um, but I want everybody to know that the Resource Center is here and that we plan to continue uh, to offer this as, as long as we need to and uh, help the community members who, um, who are gonna continue to struggle from this. This is a very expensive uh, storm, uh, whether you have insurance or not, whether um, you're a homeowner or a landlord. So. Uh, the basic needs are still going to need to be, be met, and uh, that is our goal, and that's what we plan to do. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Tate. Thanks, Raymond. That was really, really interesting um, to sort of see this, uh, you know, from view on the ground. What I'm going to do is um, take a... a uh, maybe more of a 30,000 foot view um, and talking about this idea of social vulnerability and how it relates to some of the some impacts and um, disproportionate impacts that we often see with respect to natural hazards. So uh, my name is Eric Tate and I'm a geographer at the University of Iowa and um, and I study um, both physical, economic, and social impacts from disasters. Um, so I'm a flood researcher. So a few of these slides in the beginning are about, you know, have pictures of floods, but the concepts I'm talking about really are agnostic of what kind of natural hazard it is. Uh, I think in general, what we do when we think about um, natural, extreme natural hazards, the media coverage, the governmental response, the kind of rhetoric, is often, in modeling, is often around sort of the physical characteristics of the natural hazards. So this is just, you know, looking at some characteristics of floods. Um, and then a lot about sort of the management, uh, the response, the, you know, people are being evacuated, um, disaster assistance uh, certainly gets a lot of focus. Uh, what doesn't get nearly as much focus are the social impacts. And, um, and these can vary quite a bit among populations. So uh, characteristics, are, you know, such as age and property ownership and poverty can matter a lot uh, as to the depth of the impacts that people suffer. And you really need all three to understand disasters. And this was really highlighted in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the levees and, and you know, and the, the wind speeds and the storm surge and all this other stuff, right? All this focus on the probability and risk of the storm and all these engineering solutions. Um, and, you know, there wasn't enough focus on people and we saw really the adverse impacts. And this is what kind of got me started in, in 
looking at social vulnerability, seeing pictures of people trying to hack through their roofs um, just to get out, or you know, elderly folks sitting on the on the freeway for days. So thinking of a social perspective, it at least you to, to ask different questions when you're talking about disaster readiness or, or recovery. Um, so more than just what's protected and how much it's protected, but who is protected. So if we're building dams or levees, you know, and certainly this has been a, a big discussion over the years with Cedar Rapids on, you know, which side of the river is getting what protection and who's going to pay for it and these kinds of things. Um, so the who is protected matters. Uh, who receives mitigation incentives? So these are pictures, I think, from Oklahoma thinking about tornadoes, right? So, you know, tornado safe rooms are a big deal. Uh, but who gets the incentives to put these in their homes? And, you know, oftentimes you see that it's, it's homeowners that get these incentives and these don't trickle down to renters. Uh, and of course, who gets disaster recovery assistance? And that's been a big, in the news, um, you know, with respect to the derecho over the last several weeks. Um, you know, what, what are the economic losses? What, how much focus is on that? Who's displaced? Uh, what are their conditions? Where are they going? What are their needs? What are the total business impacts? How many damaged homes? What are the states of those? Uh, what are the resources available? So, you know, these are all questions that people are still muddling their way through. So with social vulnerability to hazards, looking at the human dimensions, essentially it's like some population groups persistently face um, higher susceptibility uh, to natural hazards due to economic reasons and social re reasons, essentially the way that our society is structured. And so this chart, this table shows some major dimensions of social vulnerability. Now what's listed in here are population characteristics. So things around poverty and gender and um, home ownership. It's important to understand that these are population characteristics. These are not individual characteristics. So just because you're a member of a population doesn't mean that these attributes accrue to you. But overall, among the population, we tend to see these sort of manifestations from social vulnerability um, uh, that affect these groups, all right? So around race and ethnicity, certainly some cultural barriers and uh, more residents in high, in high hazard zones. So renters may be less eligible for post-disaster assistance. So the notion of social vulnerability really, again, is taking focus, not, not focus away from the physical uh, dimensions of, of disasters and the management of disasters, but looking at, you know, a complementary and also a sort of a root cause. And so one of the, the big disaster scholars about social vulnerability back in the 90s had this quote said, essentially, there's no sort of, there's no equal playing field around risks in, in nature, but instead there's unequal access to opportunities and unequal exposure to risks. So Raymond, I think was, was really good. He's like, look, he was saying that, you know, regardless of whether you're uh, a homeowner, uh, a refugee, people are getting, uh, are experiencing severe impacts. Um, but Terry Cannon here is saying, yes, but, you know, the, the degree of those impacts and the ability to withstand them um, vary among populations. And so we really need to think about the social dimension. And this is because, you know, when we're dealing with disasters, uh, we you know, we want to access resources and resources can come in a number of dimensions. Um, certainly economic resources, resources is the one we think about the most. Um, and so oftentimes when people are thinking about the socially vulnerable, we think about poverty. Um, and so take, for example, you have two homes that both incur, you know, $30,000 of damage. Um, you know, someone who has, um, you know, savings, insurance can withstand that $30,000 damage more than someone who doesn't have these resources. So in addition to thinking about absolute impact, it's important to think about the relative impact uh, based on these economic resources folks have, what is the impact of this, of, of this natural hazard? Um, economic resource, human resources, in other dimension. So these are characteristics, innate characteristics we have or skills that we've gained. Um, so things around our health or age, experience, skills that we can bring to bear 
um, trying to deal with or cope with impacts from hazards, extreme hazards. Um, and so factors around age and family structure and educational attainment and literacy, um, dependency ratio, how many people are being cared for in, or in the home, for example, uh, can matter a lot, okay? So human resources and others, social resources getting a lot of attention over the last 20 years or so. And this is in reference to social capital. So maybe we don't have economic resources, but I can call up a friend and you know stay with them for two weeks, right? Or maybe I can access resources through you know organizations, religious organizations or community organizations. And so certain groups um, that may have fewer or even more social resources get you know that often should be focused on are you know recent immigrants, tourists, migrant workers, refugees, um, and then finally political resources. Who you know, if you think you can call up or you can, you know, you know can email people um, and sort of their, their clout, what's your relationship with decision makers? And some groups have fewer. And so Raymond mentioned uh, the mobile home parks are getting really hit and floods. This happens a lot as well and often don't have the ear of decision makers as much as others in the community. So going back to this point of recovery assistance. I just wanted to close on talking about how recovery assistance works. Um, there's four major programs associated with the Stafford Act. And the Stafford Act is the US program for disaster assistance. And this is what, you know, if anyone is following the news, Governor Reynolds had to submit uh, an application to the federal government for a presidential disaster declaration. Once that's approved by the president, money flows through the Stafford Act. And so the principal program is called public assistance, and this goes to restore damaged public infrastructure. And so this was um, approved for, I think, what, 27 counties, I think. Um, but this is not, does not, it's not for individuals. For individuals, um, if there's an, uh, the second program is called individual assistance. It's not on the slide, but I'll get to it. If individual assistance is declared, then there's people can get access to small business administration loans. These are disaster loans. And, um, but you have to be credit worthy. You have to have collateral. You have to be a citizen. There's so there's some uh, credit check, this kind of thing. So um, it's not as, as accessible. The individual assistance. So this was what was approved for Lynn County. And so this can accrue to families and individuals. The caps are much lower than the Small Business Administration loans. And for the most part, the money goes to housing assistance. So this is restoration or at least repair, maybe not restoration, repair of private property. Uh, there are parts for personal property and other needs assistance, but these amounts are much, much lower. Okay, And I'm not going to talk about the hazard mitigation grant program. It's not really relevant um, for this discussion. So uh, I just want to leave it there and we can hit anything in the, up in the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much to Raymond and Dr. Tate. A uh, question we have here is how, and this might be more directed towards Raymond, but how has the need that you've seen changed over these three weeks with who you've seen accessing your services and uh, resources? Sure, there have been there, there's been quite a few changes over a three week period of time. Uh, there are days when it changes several times a day on what that need is um, and what's going on, what's being offered by um, other resource sites, what's being offered by the city. So some of the biggest shifts that we have seen of, of course initially um, you know, everybody wanted to protect property. So tarps and roofing nails and um, generators to get power back. Those were some of the big things. Um, and now that time has gone on, um, you know, uh, it was non-perishable food items and now it's becoming perishable food items now that power is back. Um, so those have been some of the transitions uh, that we have seen in the need. Um, now I will say the 
uh, the overall need, the number of people that we are serving on a daily basis, because we are still the only resource center that is open daily from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., which is a lot of, it, that's a long, uh, that's, uh, those are long hours for uh, something of what we're doing. Most of the resource centers were open for a few hours and maybe not every day. Um, so our, uh, our resources are spread out over, you know, the full seven days of the week. So we have started to see the number of people that we're helping on a, a daily basis uh, decrease, which is good. We hope that that means that uh, people are getting uh, their basic needs met and, um, they know that we're here when they do need something else. Um, but we've also seen some trucks coming in from around the country with lots of food, lots of fresh produce, lots of frozen meat, um, which is excellent. Those are things that people need right now with the power restored. Um, but we're starting to see another transition in the need as well to more of the follow-up yard work. So it was the large tree pieces, the branch or the, the trunks that were laying across the yard or the street. Um, now it's uh, rakes and yard bags to continue to clean up that debris so that people can finally take over, take their yard back from this disaster. Um, and then the other thing that, the other transition that we are starting to see is it is it, the majority of the individuals that we are helping are either those who are displaced currently um, or they are living in a um, more more densely populated area like an apartment complex, um, a mobile home park, um, and lower uh, lower income areas of town. Uh, we do collect that information just so we can kind of track and see where the need exists and uh, if we need to do something differently with what we're doing here. So there have been a lot of transitions, but uh, our uh, where we are now is uh, mostly to serving those that are still displaced and in high uh, highly populated areas, so. Thank you. Okay, another question I have here that m might be more directed to Dr. Tate is uh, a number of the mitigations or pre-disaster supports that you spoke about were more directed towards homeowners. And what are some things that are in place to help um, prevent the the big impact to people who are not homeowners. Yeah, so <laughs> this is I would say there's a gap in our federal programs for for certain populations. Uh, non homeowners definitely stands out, um, and generally what we see with disasters is that they they amplify the pre disaster trajectory. Okay. So if you had groups that are struggling or just making it before the disaster, after the disaster, it's actually worse. Um, and so this is a lot of the work that I do is trying to understand where these gaps are in these disaster programs. And so there are some resources through the individual assistance program, um, but they're, they're, if you think about it, these SBA loan programs, they're large dollar amounts, $200,000 loans, $40,000 loans, and these can help restore, okay? And through the individual assistance program, the stuff that's at homeowners can help repair. Um, and then for the stuff that's for the non-homeowners, it's much smaller amounts. And I think it's just for surviving, for coping in the immediate term. Um, and it's not anywhere, you know, helping people get back on their feet. So yeah, there's some real holes in these uh, federal programs. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, one thing I also noticed, and, and you can speak to this as well, I'm sure both of you, is that a lot of the badly damaged structures were what I would guess are poorly constructed apartment buildings that aren't really designed to withstand this type of storm. And, and I wonder, it made me think, I, I wonder how that plays into it as well, where the the actual structures, and, and you talked about the mitigation incentives, Dr. Tate, um, but the actual structures are, are designed more poorly um, in addition to other societal structures that are uh, disadvantaging certain communities. Yeah, certainly it's no secret that there's relationships between uh, economic resources in households and what you can afford in terms of quality of construction. 
And this is something we see disaster after disaster, uh, especially, you know, I do a lot of work with floods and, you know, mobile home parks are particularly vulnerable. And, it, you know, it's a combination of where they get sited and what the rules are and, um, you know, affordability. So that's a persistent challenge. And it's tied to what Raymond was talking about, about, you know, housing affordability, which is, you know, after the disaster, a lot, even a larger challenge than it already was. All right, another question we have here is, uh, can you address some of the indirect effects of the storms? For instance, after Hurricane Maria, fatalities increased after the hurricane due to a lack of access to electricity and medical care. Is the same taking place in Cedar Rapids? So maybe Raymond, you could start with this and Dr. Tate, you could add in. Sure, so, um, you know, of course, uh, when the storm hit, uh, there was only one initial fatality uh, that was reported. And I think people were shocked because of the extent of the damage. Um, and so for the after, um, the, the effects after the storm, um, I have heard stories of individuals who are on life-saving devices such as oxygen or CPAP machines um, that did not have access to electricity for an extended period of time and have since lost their lives. Um, so I, I, I don't know the numbers on that, uh, but uh, we've heard stories that that uh, is taking place. So um, unfortunately, I think that uh, as time goes on and as we continue to uh, check on our neighbors, you know, we may find that there, there are more fatal fatalities than we uh, would like to believe due to lack of resources in general, even if it wasn't just you know, their oxygen machine running, but um, somebody who has not been chucked on yet, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a tough one because what we tend to do and, you know, thinking about disaster impacts is focus on the things that are really tangible. Uh, that's what gets the news, right? How many trees were, were felled and how many, how many homes are, are damaged and that's kind of thing. But these indirect effects <clears throat> can be even more devastating. They're a little bit more hidden and they're stretched out over time. You know, what's, what's the impact of the emotional stress um, that people are facing, the trauma that they're facing, the, you know, the lack of, you know, what's the level of trust in institutions um, within the community? What about, you know, disruptions to public service and to uh, tax revenue? It's, it's going to be very difficult to understand how impactful this disaster is um, without more time. But yes, these indirect impacts can be uh, quite severe. Okay, another question we have here is, what types of questions should we be asking political candidates so that we might begin to mitigate these disparities in our community and across the nation? Big question. Uh, I mean, I can talk about, you know, certainly state and federal policy. And I think it tracks with a lot of things that are being discussed this summer. I mean, with COVID and all these things, right? Like about equity. We design all these programs and who are they benefiting? And so if that's a general framework for how we're, you know, trying to design and evaluate public policy, it's, you know, a lot of times we just focus on these benefit cost analyses, purely in economic terms. Um, but I think, you know, if we start to apply more of an equity framework, you know, who's benefiting? Is it, is it, is it satisfying the needs of people? Uh, I, I think if we start asking these questions in a fundamental nature, uh, it can change the way that our programs are, are, um, are designed. But you're right, if we're not asking that of our politicians, then it's gonna be slow going if ever till uh, we get there. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that, Raymond? I would say uh, mine comes from less of a, you know, Dr. Tate obviously is uh, uh, very knowledgeable on this and mine is more of a boots on the ground, you know, to, the, to our politicians. Where are the resources? Where, where are they? Uh, where is the temporary housing? Um, are city buildings available for temporary housing? 
um, instead of passing people around and just finding, trying to find temporary beds for them. Um, you know, mine's more from a frustration standpoint that I'm hearing from the community members who are visiting my resource center, asking me for housing, asking me how I can get them into a hotel room, um, which doesn't exist. The hotel rooms are book here, booked here. You know, it's not like we can just call up any uh, hotel in the area and, mm -hmm. and find a, a rate that works for a program out there. Um, my questions or the questions that I would encourage people to ask are what are they doing for, I mean, especially for those, uh, um, for the council members, you know, what are they doing for their neighborhood? Let's, let's chunk this down, um, you know, going to a state level and saying, Hey, what are you going to do for us? They have a much larger area to look at, but if we take it and, and chunk it down to neighborhoods or um, areas uh, by council individuals, you know, how can they help? What is the immediate need in that area? Because the other thing that we need to keep in mind is the need in one neighborhood or one apartment complex or one mobile home park could be completely different from the need across town. Um, so trying to do a one, uh, you know, a one size fits all approach here is just not going to work, but we need to ensure that our people are safe and that they have access to shelter and that they have access to their basic needs. Um, so again, mine comes from more of a frustration and, and heartfelt plea of, you know, we still need the resources. We don't have them yet uh, to ensure that our people are protected, so. And so um, Becky asks here, could the type of emergency response you're coordinating or facilitating, Raymond, could that be incorporated proactively into a hazard response plan with the government uh, and you know, who, I guess also too, who are you seeing out there alongside you? Are there other groups that have responded as, as well? Are, are, are all, is everybody volunteers or are there other uh, government or organizations? All right, you asked me a very uh, zinging Sorry. question there. Sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Becky, I, first and foremost, I wanna preface this with, I have no knowledge of disaster relief. I have no, I've never lived through a disaster. I've never volunteered in a, I mean, I volunteered during the flood to sandbag. Um, but outside of that, you know, I have no uh, professional experience. So what I have, uh, what has developed, not what I have developed, but what has developed uh, into what it is today was just a grass, uh, grassroots effort to try to help. And um, would I like to work alongside the, the the local city, county, and state governments to help? I mean, I've brought in resources from all over the country with this Facebook page. Yes, I would love to partner with them. Um, unfortunately, as we know, there was some slow response uh, from Red Cross and FEMA um, and United Way. And I apologize if, any, if that upsets anybody that I'm using their names, but I think that it's really important to understand that we invest in these things on a regular basis. Um, and we are funding them through our own donations. Um, yet when we need them, they weren't there. And uh, when approached by them and when in conversations with them, it did not go well. It did not it did not lead to a partnership with any of those organizations. It really divided more uh, what I was trying to do as a private person uh, rather than a community member. You know, I was I was sought as somebody who was uh, not necessarily fairly distributing my resources, which anybody is welcome to the resources that we have. This was set up so that any individual who um, affected by the storm or really not affected by the storm because we were not checking, um, you know, has access to these resources. Um, you know, we would, we would have loved to a partner. We still, you know, we would still partner with them. Um, uh, again, though, I don't, I don't have the knowledge or the resources to um, go to the next level of maybe temporary housing. Um, you know, I was hoping that they would focus on that and we could focus on the food, um, you know, or what have you and split, you know, divide those responsibilities up, let that, you know, let them take care of the safety part of it. And um, that just didn't seem to happen. And it's still not. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question. But uh, I'm definitely frustrated in the way things that have gone. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue my efforts as long as there's a need for it. And uh, like Dr. Uh, Tate was talking about, this is going to take time. There are people that are 
not going to feel, feel the effects of this uh, necessarily right away, especially if it's a, um, a mental health trauma or uh, some long-term or long-lasting effect, it may take some time. So, uh, you know, that's, excuse me, we're here um, as long as the community shows that there's a need for it. So I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank uh, you. Otherwise, clarify. <laughs> thank you. And, and, and Dr. Tate, can you speak at all to what you've seen in disaster response as the, as the role of individual grassroots efforts versus organizations versus government? Because I imagine it plays out very differently in every sort of scenario. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's actually a bit mind boggling to me the way that we set up sort of federal response to disaster for, you know, unmet social needs or the unmet needs of socially vulnerable populations. And we primarily just, um, we, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where you contracted out to nonprofits. So through the individual assistance program, right? There's, there's money for crisis management and these will go to these, some of these organizations for case management and this kind of stuff. Um, but yet, you know, the federal government doesn't play a direct role in, in these, in this process. So, um, I just don't think it's really set up and, and, you know, organizations like Raymond's, right. It's not, they doesn't have a preexisting relationship with FEMA, you know, before the event. So it's going to be left out in the cold. So I can see why there's, I'm not surprised by the lack of coordination. We also, you know, when the other things we, we don't often think about is what are the impacts to these organizations and the political leaders themselves? You know, we saw, for example, in the flood, like some people, their own homes are flooded, right? And we don't, you know, it's hard to understand, like, what would the, the capacity of United Way versus, you know, some of these other, other organizations, how that was hindered, in addition to the communication stuff. Um, so I, I think the whole system is not really, it's not anywhere close to being optimized to help the unmet needs of populations. I have a number of people asking what is the best way to help and how do they help with, with this particular disaster and other disasters. So sometimes you hear from, you know, in FEMA trainings, they say, don't deploy unless you are called. And in, in other situations, there's a particular way you can help and other ways that, that seem helpful that are actually somewhat uh, problematic. So. Could either of you speak to to those things, both for this disaster and others? So I, I will say that uh, as far as the don't deploy thing, um, that would be that would mean that I did not create a Facebook group to try to bring people together. That would mean that I did not ask a business owner to borrow two parking spots so that we could have a, a trading post where people could deliver goods and people could pick them up. Um, and to me, that is backwards thinking. Um, in a time of need and disaster, this is catastrophic. This is way too large for any of our local entities to uh, handle. There was no way that they, the police department, the fire department, uh, that they were going to be able to handle this. And as we know, National Guard was not called in right away. Um, so First, I would say that that is, uh, that is abs absolutely backwards thinking. I would say ways that people can help right now and in future disasters as far as a grassroots effort is concerned is to uh, check on your neighbors. I say that a thousand times a day um, because we all know that everybody has different, uh, different abilities. And if that means that the cell phone towers are down and we cannot communicate in a way that we are uh, most comfortable and used to, knocking your neighbor's door maybe the next best thing to make sure that they're okay, save a life. Um, and you don't have to go far. You don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a treacherous situation uh, because of course we want you to be safe as well um, in anything that you're trying to do to help. But that to me is, you know, check on the people that you know and don't know because right now we don't know where the people that they do know are. Um, we couldn't communicate via phone. So if, their people were out of state or out of the area, who was checking on them if it was not via phone. Um, so that was, uh, that was a sh even to this day, we're still doing door knocking uh, when we're in a neighborhood cleaning up. 
just because we want to make sure that if somebody's house looks like it has not been addressed at all, is there somebody in there? Is somebody trapped? Does somebody uh, have a, you know, are they mentally not in a good place where they don't know how to ask for help or they're not asking for help? Um, and so I'm encouraging everybody to go to, to do that when they're in the neighborhood and if they're comfortable. Um, so on a grand, you know, in, in any disaster, I think checking on the people that you can get access to is probably uh, the first and foremost, you know, we are, people are the most important. Um, and then once we, you know, know that it, people are okay, we can move on to finding the resources and then aiding the recovery. Um, but uh, what we can do right here, right now in this situation um, is continue to provide for those that express the need. Because again, like Dr. Tate said, and he corrected, I think a little bit in a very nice way, uh, something that I said about, you know, it's not just um, uh, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, and really it doesn't, you know, it's not always just poverty that, you know, the, it's not just those individuals that are um, struggling during and after a disaster. Um, so what that tells me is that there's going to be a need beyond just the disadvantaged populations, the underserved populations. There are people that are just over that SNAP benefit or, or food stamp benefit line where they dissolve their entire savings account to pay for repairs or get a hotel room for a night so that they could get out of the heat or protect their children. Um, they're still going to need food, but if they've depleted their savings and if they're struggling to get back to work for whatever reason um, and compound this with a pandemic, right? There were already other issues where people weren't working and the income was an issue. Um, you know, we are going to need to continue to fulfill basic needs uh, with food and hygiene products and diapers and wipes for the kiddos. Those are expensive items that if we can take a little bit of that stress and pressure off of a family or a household um, so that they can continue Continue forward with little steps to recovery and, and protect themselves. Um, you know, that's going to be a long time coming. This is not going away tomorrow. So um, for anybody watching my page uh, and my group and the website, um, you know, I know that it looks like we're asking for stuff all the time, but it's because those are the things that the community is asking us for. And we want to keep replenishing those items so that we can continue to get them out to the community members so that they can continue uh, or start the road to recovery if they have not yet and focus on the things that really matter to them uh, right here and right now so that uh, they can see that light because uh, for some of them who don't have a home or in temporary housing, that light's still pretty far away for them if they can, even if they have a glimpse of it, so. Yeah, it sounds like you're really focusing on listening to what people want and responding to that as opposed to assuming you must want this or you must need this. And I think that's really important as well. Dr. Tate, did you wanna to speak to that question? Uh, that was a great answer. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you, Raymond. Okay, and another question here from Drinda is, how do we bring the voices of the vulnerable to the table? Is there a way to prepare for this? And uh, she says, someone in the community who has the ear of the mayor, council supervisors, et cetera. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's like anything else in society. Those with power and access tend to be able to influence more. So I think unless we have explicit policies that call for the inclusion of, you know, groups that don't tend to have access to decision makers and in, po in policy development, um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult, um, frankly. So I, I do think some of these organizations uh, that work directly with people uh, are potentially decent aggregators of information. So like Habitat for Humanity, for example, has a great understanding of housing issues, right? And so they're dealing with a lot of people and then can speak in technical terms and the language that, you know, policymakers might, um, would, you know, speak, right? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a place for these, I, I like to call them as like connector organizations because they could sit at the intermediary between sort of groups that are having resources and making decisions and individuals who are, are experiencing uh, challenges. 
Okay, we have time for just a couple more questions here and have lots of good ones. So um, what codes or ordinances govern the constructions of home and multifamily dwellings? And do these codes need updating due to climate changes and, and the consequent uh, increase in severity of natural disasters? Good question. I'm certainly not a code expert uh, as far as the, the building codes are concerned and what they are currently um, or what they were. I mean, if we think back to or if we look at the properties that were damaged, you know, some of those were brand new houses and some of those were 30, 40, 50, 100 years old. Um, so I think, you know, um, maybe they do need to be addressed. Maybe they need to be evaluated uh, to an extent where, you know, now we know that we're capable of having 140 mile per hour winds. What does that look like? Um, but with the understanding that, you know, that's going to adjust construction cost, affordability of housing, um, and it's going to complicate things for, for builders that, um, you know, have built for 50 plus years and have muddled through the code changes. Um, not to say that they shouldn't happen, but uh, maybe in a reevaluation, but not a total overhaul of the codes. Um, because when you look at the properties that were damaged, they weren't all old buildings. Um, they, some of them were newer construction. Some of them were older construction. And so when you think about that, you're like, okay, an older building typically stands up better to, you know, uh, the wind, the heavy winds or snowfall or what have you. Yet uh, here we are in a situation where Really, I don't think that there was a property that was spared, um, Bill. You know, it, I think he, those who did not get hit by a tree, you know, were, did as as good as they were going to do. The trees obviously caused the the most amount of damage um, when it comes to you know the, affecting the properties the most. So uh, that that's my view on it. I'm not a code expert, but uh, uh, I think maybe we should chat with Florida a little bit more and see what what minor changes we could make just to reinforce some things. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with disasters. They can be focusing events. And so after Hurricane Andrew in South Florida, um, you know, after severe tornadoes in Oklahoma, floods in Louisiana, you know, there's often changes to build, you know, construction codes uh, after reevaluation. And especially with climate change, uh, it can be difficult. It makes it um, the past is less relevant to try and understand what could happen in the future. So uh, I think it's certainly a good question to consider. Uh, I don't know to what extent that's been discussed, though. So just to sum up some final questions here, uh, we have people asking about particular services like uh, crisis counseling and translating. And I, I think that speaks to the focus from society often being on the physical structures and economic impact and, and these things like crisis counseling and translating be sort of an afterthought. So uh, with, with that in mind and also thoughts about traje trajectory for recovery, what, what ideas or insights do either of you have on, on those things? I'd, I'd like to actually turn that on to Raymond because mm -hmm. he's going to be such a better under, you know, of being right in the middle of much better understanding of like, what are the major gaps um, that are, that are, you know, still there. Okay. So uh, as far as, uh, if I understood the question correctly, it had to do with, um, kind of where we're going, how we, you know, move forward from here um, and uh, start to rebuild the area. Is that? Yeah, and, and aftermath of disaster things, like I said, there's often, uh, it, it's an afterthought for things like crisis counseling sure, and sure. Uh, translating. And... Yeah, so we can't stop talking about this disaster. Um, that is going to be uh, if we stop talking about this and we go back to our daily lives the way that they were on August 9th, 
we are going to be no better off than we are today. Um, because what we know and what we've talked about today, you know, the, the longevity of some of the effects of this, um, you know, we need to be prepared for those. And for those that need crisis counseling today, there are services set up um, and you can visit, uh, whether it's the city, county or state websites, um, it, we have access to all of those here as well. So for somebody who does not have access to the internet, please visit our location, reach out to us via phone or text. Um, we will be happy to help you get those resources. Um, same with uh, translators, um, you know, I, I think most people just don't show up to a resource if they believe that there's going to be a language barrier because they don't want to put themselves in that situation. So if you are a translator, if you're somebody who can help connect or bridge that gap, please reach out to the communities in which you are familiar with or, or familiarize yourself with those communities who um, do not speak the, the, the the English language. I mean, let's be honest, that's in my facility. I don't have anybody in here who um, can help bridge that gap. And if you show up as a translator, you know, we're just kind of waiting for someone to show up who you can help, where if you could take your resource to the neighborhood, to the apartment complex, to the city, to the town, wherever it is that it's needed and bring that to us, we can do a better job of bridging that gap during a disaster, before a disaster, during and after. I mean, let's, you know, in, in all honesty, um, I can imagine that there's people who have not utilized our resources uh, just because they're not comfortable with that, that language barrier or that cultural barrier um, that they believe may exist if they were trying to get access to our, our resources. So um, for, a, for any of that, for translating or the crisis counseling stuff, um, please reach out to us. We'll do everything we can to help bridge that gap and get the resources to those in need. Okay, I wanna thank you both so much and for all our attendees as well for being here today and for all your uh, insight and questions. And so we have a link, we will have a link to uh, a recording of this on our website at uichr.org. And I also have posted there a link to Raymond's storm resource page, uh, both the website and the Facebook group, and to Dr. Tate's research and profile. And uh, if you have any questions, you can, of course, feel free to email UICHR uh, at uiowa.edu. And thank you so much, Raymond and Dr. Tate. And goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.